Okay, Dr. Taylor, if you can hear us, my name is Rodney Palmer, and we are in a room full of medical doctors and healthcare practitioners in a very uh, oak-lined room, uh, part of uh, Toronto's history, where we have about 60 people in the room who have been listening this morning and this afternoon to uh, Dr. Deborah Davis, Dr. Anthony Miller, and Dr. Magda Havis about the many effects of uh, microwave radiation on humans, and we're hoping today, at, at this point, at this juncture, for the next 15 minutes or so, if you can talk to us about the the effects on reproduction and I'll give you the floor. Am I coming through okay? Everybody can hear me? Perfect. Perfect. Great. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate the invitation. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about one of the studies uh, we conducted looking at cell phone radiation exposure and how it affects behavior. Uh, I'm an obstetrician gynecologist, so I've been very interested in particularly fetal exposure, what happens during pregnancy and developmental programming. And, you know, we are, we are now beginning to understand about how, uh, really the extent of what happens in the womb and how it's carried with us for the rest of our lives, that it affects our physiology, our disease susceptibility, how we age. Uh, so much of who we are today really uh, uh, was programmed in the womb while we were still a fetus. Um, and our original study uh, that I will present to you today uh, looked at the effect of cell phone uh, exposure on behavior. Uh, just for full disclosure, I was interested in some other endpoints initially. Uh, we thought uh, that cell phone exposure in the womb might uh, be related to uh, potential infertility. There have been several reports about cell phone exposure decreasing sperm counts and affecting egg production in women, um, and we thought that perhaps that fetal exposure might be even more significant. In, in general, uh, the fetus is uh, the uh, most fragile um, uh, of any age uh, stage, that the fetus is very vulnerable to any sort of insults, that when development is being programmed, uh, that we are susceptible to all sorts of uh, uh, interference that may not have had uh, as a significant effect on an adult. So uh, originally when we designed the study, we, again, fertility was one of our main endpoints, and we designed some behavioral tests in case the mice weren't getting pregnant, we wanted to know if they were actually interacting with the other mice and mating, if that might not be a reason for their infertility. Turns out in the end, uh, uh, that these mice actually were fertile, that we did not see a, uh, a decrease in fertility. The, the, what was designed as the control experiment uh, turned out to be the one with the most significant findings, that there were significant effects on the brain, the way the brain develops, the way it's programmed uh, in the fetus, and uh, the uh, behavior of these mice uh, when they get older. Um, interestingly, that while we were conducting these studies, uh, another study came out uh, that was a study in women uh, in, from Denmark that looked at cell phone use in pregnancy and um, around young children. And what they found in that study was that there was a uh, significant effect um, of cell phone use during pregnancy and subsequent behavior of those children. Um, uh, when uh, this showed that at least there was that clear association between cell phone use and uh, behavioral problems in children uh, and humans. Now, of course, you can always make uh, the claim that these studies just look at association. They don't prove cause and effect. Uh, you know, the critics would say, well, if the mother was talking on the cell phone all the time, maybe she was ignoring her children and that led to behavioral problems. Um, we really wanted to get at a study that would tell us whether this could be cause and effect, where there would be absolutely no difference uh, except exposure to that cell phone radiation. And to that, we, we, um, we turned to an animal model. If you can just go to the second slide. Um, again, the, the idea was that cell phone use may be uh, more harmful to a fetus even than an adult, again, a very vulnerable stage. And many women, as is shown pictured here, uh, hold that cell phone right next to their abdomen when they're pregnant, uh, when they're texting. They may clip that cell phone right to their waist onto a belt or pants. They may hold it in a bag at their waist uh, uh, over their shoulder and hanging at their waist right next to their baby. 
So the the proximity is there uh, to perhaps uh, uh, do more damage to the fetus the way we use the cell phone uh, during pregnancy. If you go to the third slide, we'll get into our study. This was reported just two years ago in uh, Scientific Reports, a nature journal. Um, and we looked at uh, the uh, effects on neurodevelopment behavior uh, from uh, cell phone exposure. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, this uh, again will just start to outline what we actually did in this study. We looked again at the programming of the brain, how the brain developed uh, with or without cell phone exposure. And what we did is we, we took these cell phones and we put them over the pregnant uh, mouse cage. Now, we had 33 mice that were in a cage that had a cell phone that was active on top of it. And we had another 42 mice uh, that had uh, a, an inactivated cell phone on top of the cage. The mice didn't know um, whether the cell phone was active or not. Uh, but it was emitting radiation in the uh, exposed mice and not emitting the radiation in the, the control mice. And we kept that phone on top of that cage throughout the pregnancy. Now, uh, these mice typically have litter sizes of about 10. So again, there are 10 times as many mice exposed um, as a fetus as there are pregnant mice listed here. So those 33 pregnant mice that were exposed uh, uh, each had roughly 10 um, offspring. So we're looking at over 300 uh, radiation exposed and over 400 controls. If you go to the next slide, um, this uh, describes in a little more detail uh, the study. We had these uh, cell phones uh, that were muted and silenced. So again, the mice, they weren't making any noise to indicate whether they were on or not. The mice had no way of knowing whether the phone was on or not. Uh, these were fairly standard cell phones. Uh, SAR rating, pretty typical. We, we just used commercial cell phones uh, that were available to us uh, with a local carrier. And uh, again, simply put the uh, cell phone, uh, either the muted and silenced but active cell phone that was emitting the radiation, uh, or a uh, cell phone that was turned off over the uh, control cages. Um, and the, these phones were positioned right at the top of the cage. Uh, there's a little feeding bottle that comes down into the cage uh, right in the middle, and we just put it right next to that. And depending, the mice were free to run around the cage, so depending on where they were uh, in the cage, that distance from the cell phone varied from uh, about four centimeters to 20 centimeters. Uh, but uh, again, the mice weren't constrained. So somewhere in that uh, general um, uh, range uh, of distance from the, the cell phone, depending on where they were at any given time in the cage. And then when the uh, gestation was over, after the pups were born, we turned the phones off, took the phones away, and then tested the, these mice that were exposed to the fetus as adults. So we waited many weeks for them to grow up before we actually did the uh, behavioral testing. Uh, so again, these mice were not exposed to cell phone radiation after birth. We were really isolating the effect of the in utero exposure, the exposure during pregnancy. If you go to the next slide, uh, this will uh, show you uh, our results and some of the behavioral tests that were conducted. Uh, first slide, you can see the, the um, uh, memory was decreased. Those top solid circles are the control mice, and the uh, open circles are the exposed mice. And you can see at several different time points from birth, um, all uh, considered adult mice, um, the memory was significantly decreased. And the summary of this is on the right side of the screen. You can see the average over those time points. There was a significant decrease in memory in those exposed to the cell phone radiation as a fetus. Again, they're tested as an adult when they had not had any further cell phone uh, exposure. So again, this looks at how their brains are developing and how the cell phone radiation affects the brains during uh, development as a fetus. We next, in the second uh, row, we looked at hyperactivity, and you can see they had increased hyperactivity. 
they were much more active, moving around the cage more, um, again, significantly increased at each of those time points. Um, anxiety was actually decreased. Um, they were running around the cage. They were more likely to come out in the, in the bright light uh, and weren't nervous about this at all. They would be uh, um, very relaxed about this. So uh, next, uh, next row shows fear. They had no change in fear. So again, poor memory, very active, but uh, not anxious about this. They were just bouncing off the walls of the cage without a care in the world. Um, significantly different behavior uh, than the mice that weren't exposed to cell phone radiation. And again, we know there was absolutely no difference between these two groups of mice other than that uh, fetal cell phone exposure. They're the same genetic background, the very same diet, the same cages, the same environment. Uh, so uh, no other difference that could account for these uh, behavioral differences that we found. Clearly, they look very different. To go to the next slide, we, we tried to extrapolate from this and uh, tried to estimate uh, what uh, this could resemble in humans. And the closest thing we found was uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or, or um, ADHD, sometimes just called attention deficit disorder. But uh, this is on the rise in the United States. It's increasing just as cell phone use has increased. And it involves hyperactivity, difficulty paying attention, and impulsivity. Uh, exactly the same type of behavior we were seeing in the mice. Now, I don't want to say that this is identical, uh, because mice don't get ADHD. It's a human condition. Uh, but this was uh, as close as, um, uh, close as the closest thing we could discern in humans uh, that might resemble the types of behaviors we were seeing in, this, in these mice. Next, to see if uh, there was some biologic basis for this behavior, if you can go to that next slide, um, we actually looked at the um, uh, electrical activity in the brain. We did electrophysiologic studies to look at the uh, frequency of uh, uh, synaptic potentials between neurons. And particularly, we focused on the prefrontal cortex, the area of the brain uh, that drives many of these behaviors. And if you compared the control mice to those who had the full 24-hour-a-day exposure during pregnancy, and you look at their brains as adults, you can see that there are differences in the frequency of these uh, synaptic uh, conductivity, that there was real difference in the electrical activity of these brains that correlated with these changes in behavior. So their brains really developed differently. They were permanently affected due to the cell phone exposure for those few days during gestation. Uh, mouse gestation is about 20 days. Um, so during those, that 20-day exposure uh, had a, a permanent effect on their behavior and on the electrical activity of the brain in areas that account for that behavior um, that was uh, persistent and that they carried with them throughout their lives. So permanently affected brain development. If you go to the next slide, um, this shows that there is a diminished effect in that uh, change in electrical activity uh, when the uh, time of exposure is decreased. So if we go out to 24 hours a day, you can see there's the lowest uh, frequency. As you back off on that exposure time and reduce it to uh, fewer hours per day, you can see a nice dose response there that as they uh, were exposed for shorter durations each day, uh, the effect was lower. So that's good news, that there is certainly um, uh, an, uh, a dose response if we uh, use lower doses, lower uh, amounts of exposure time, um, perhaps we can uh, not see these same type of profound effects. Uh, thankfully, that's good news when we talk about uh, uh, changing uh, behaviors in, in humans. If I go on to the next slide, again, what are the implications uh, for women, especially in pregnancy? What is the implication for our, our uh, the fetus that may be exposed to these um, uh, frequencies? Again, we haven't proven that this uh, occurs in humans. Mice are smaller. They have thinner skulls. But I think the, uh, the thing that is most uh, concerning for me is that when you have 
epidemiologic studies that show that the association is clearly there in humans, that uh, women who spend more time on the cell phone when they're pregnant have a higher chance of having a, children, a child with a behavioral disorder. Um, when, you have, when you know that this is happening in humans and you have a mouse study clearly that shows cell phone radiation can cause this problem, I think that's good enough reason, uh, a very powerful reason to think that, uh, that that association to human really is truly causative and we should think about warning women about cell phone exposure. Um, again, as shown in this picture, women who are pregnant often are holding that cell phone and texting while that phone is right on their abdomen, uh, right next to their baby. Or they may put it in their bag at their waist that might be right next to the baby or clip it onto their belt. Um, so the exposure uh, is exactly there, right next to the baby, um, and uh, um, moving it away uh, is a, probably a very good idea. Why hold it right over uh, your pregnant abdomen and affect your baby? If you look at that next slide, uh, this goes over a principle you probably already discussed, I guess, in this meeting, uh, that the um, cell phone radiation from the phone, it's a fairly powerful transmitter that's sending out this radiation to the cell phone tower, um, but it's decreased with the square of the distance uh, from the body. So, you know, even a small change in um, distance from the body can have an even larger effect on uh, radiation exposure. You move it twice as far away, you've reduced your exposure to a quarter. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot to dramatically reduce uh, your exposure. You move it 10 times away, that's, you know, one one hundredth, one percent of the exposure. You've reduced your exposure by 99 percent. It's fairly easy to be cautious about this um, and uh, start to protect uh, the fetus. So the next slide, um, again, shows that same phone by the abdomen. I'm often asked by patients, well, should I not talk as much on the cell phone? Well, if they move the cell phone up closer to their ear and away from their baby, that's probably actually good for the baby. But what I tell patients is to uh, think about uh, moving that cell phone away from their abdomen, that when they're home, put it on the other side of the room. When they're in their car, put it, on the, put it in the back seat or the other seat next to them. Don't keep it clipped to your belt. Uh, when they're in their office or, or workplace, you know, put it up on the desk or on a table near them or on the other side of the room. They don't have to keep it clipped to their, to their abdomen and certainly don't text uh, by holding the phone right over the abdomen. These type of simple changes in behavior have essentially no downside, aren't very difficult, uh, but may uh, do dramatic things to uh, uh, protect the fetus and reduce that radiation exposure. And um, if I can go on to the next slide, I think this cell phone issue comes into a much broader issue. We know that environmental exposures play a, a tremendous role in the health of the next generation. Cell phones, chemical exposures, there's so many things that we're introducing into our environment that weren't here before uh, that may very well uh, affect us in ways that we couldn't have anticipated. Um, that um, uh, we haven't studied well enough. And um, it's important that we do start to take a look at these, study these more carefully. Uh, there are clearly ways to reduce these type of exposures. And if I can go to the next slide, um, you know, this shows a, a very rural area where there are no use of cell phones and uh, no chemical exposures. Do we have to go back to this? I don't think we have to go quite this far. I'm still using a cell phone, but I think we can be a little more intelligent about how we use it, move it away from us, um, we don't have to go without these things, but we can use them in a way that limits the exposure. And then if you can go to my final slide, I think this just makes the point is we really need to sort out just how dangerous these exposures are. Uh, you know, what is truly, really dangerous? What might be acceptable level of risk? We don't yet know uh, that uh, how much fetal exposure really does cause any harm, no harm, or a lot of harm. And I think we need further studies to parse that out um, so we can give clear recommendation as to what's safe and what's not. Uh, but for now, I think it's worth uh, taking some caution, better safe than sorry, as we say, the precautionary principle. Uh, it's so easy to move your cell phone a little bit away from your body when you are pregnant. Uh, there's really no downside to doing that and uh, potentially save your baby from uh, tremendous uh, harm. 
And I'll end there and, and take just a minute or two for questions if there is time. You thank you very, very much for that. Um, we do have a microphone set up. We didn't know if you would be available for questions, but if anybody does have any questions, this is an absolutely critical point of research that we're talking about the unborn, the ones that have no rights yet, the ones that are exposed to what we expose them to. And the first question is going to come uh, from Dr. Rena Bray from Women's College Hospital. Hi, Dr. Taylor. <clears throat> Thanks for that talk, that was great. Um, my question is the um, couple of questions. The the cell phone that was above the the mice was it ringing? Was it on? Was it like what sort of emission was it um, was it uh, giving? So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing the question, but I think the question was was the was the cell phone on? And, and yes, That's it's right. important to know even when you're not talking on the cell phone, the cell phone's still communicating with the tower. Uh, there's radiation emitted from the cell phone even when you're not on an active call. Uh, in reality, we had these phones on an active call uh, the entire time, but then the phone was silent, so it was not making noise. Uh, the speaker was turned off, but the radiation was still uh, being emitted. It was communicating with the cell phone tower, uh, but the mice didn't know that the cell phone was turned on because it, you know, the sound was, was turned off. Okay, so educate me, please. <laughs> You've got a cell phone, <clears throat> and it's not being used. It might be in 3G mode. It might be in another mode of what, whatever it is. How often is it firing off to find out if it's connected to a, a tower? My understanding is that they, and I, I'm not the, the expert on the, the cell phone mechanics itself, but that this is a constant. They are constantly emitting uh, radiation and making sure they're connected with that tower at all times. But in this case, we had those cell phones on an active call the entire time. So they were always communicating. Okay, the so line the, was open. So the line was open at all times. Okay, yeah, because I've I've mucked around with cell phones for a while, <laughs> trying to measure things and turning it off, doing it this, da da da, da. and um, it's not as clear cut as I thought it might be. And so it would be really good to get that sorted out. I think exactly what people are being exposed to because. Um, do you know what sort of microwatts per meter squared? Um, you know, do you do you have any numbers as to what they were being exposed to exactly? I'm sorry, could, I, I'm having trouble with the connection here to, you, to hear you well. Hugh, do you how did you record exactly the SAR or uh, any other uh, metric by what you were exposing the mice to? No, we didn't. We weren't able to measure the exposure. You know, again, that's very difficult to do to somehow determine how much is absorbed in the in the brain of these mice. Uh, we would like to do that, but uh, that's that's not an easy task. No, exactly. And this is my point. Really, is that okay? So we have pregnant women wandering around all over the place, and they're going in and out of malls. They're going, you know, into institutions, into hospitals, etc. Can you hear me? Sorry. Maybe that this microphone's connected and yours is. So we have women at risk all the time, whether they have a cell phone on or not, and they're going into institutions, to hospitals, to places where there's a lot of Wi-Fi around. So the yeah. question is, you've got a certain amount of exposure that could be extremely high in a pregnant woman, and you know, people have gone in and measured these places, and I've seen patients with their reports, and some places are extremely high in terms of microwatts per meter squared. And I'm just trying to get a feel for this because I think if we could look at the literature and see what else is out there in terms of getting numbers out, we actually have a really good case for um, putting up signs in places where there is a lot of Wi-Fi use. A good example is a hospital that just recently did a, a Wi-Fi rollout and everybody's getting sick. Um, and also universities too, lots of Wi-Fi in universities and, and, and women are getting pregnant there and things are not going right. So um, this kind of stuff is really important um, and I would love if anyone has any more comments to make, I'd love that because um, I'm sure we'll be all over it and we would actually be able to do something with it in Toronto. Thank you. Yeah. I think that was the point of my last slide. That little cartoon uh, uh, was basically saying just that. We need to define what uh, types of exposures, how much exposure is harmful to what tissues, organs, how much to an adult, how much to a fetus. Those numbers may be different. 
uh, and depending on the different uh, radiation source, the different amounts of energy, I think we're still just the beginning of defining these harms, and I think we need much more detailed uh, information before we can start to to quantify and know exactly what levels are harmful or safe. But I think we can already say that the levels we're exposed to now uh, have consequences, uh, and we need to do further studies to find out exactly what thresholds uh, are, are the ones we should be setting uh, uh, limits, notifying people, or legislating. Okay. I, think I do have to uh, sign off now, but thank you very much for having me. Again, I wish I could have been there in person. You, thank you very much, and there's a huge number of people uh, lined up here. We're going to hope that um, Dr. Deborah Davis uh, will uh, stand for you, uh, perhaps for the rest of the questions here, and we, we can't thank you enough uh, for, for taking time out today. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. So um, Frank's suggestion, Deborah, if you've consumed enough food, there's been enough nutritional absorption for you to stand up here, maybe you could sit uh, Dever worked, has worked closely with you uh, recently on some of this work and is, uh, has certainly, if not worked on it, has read it and understood it and been involved with trying to bring it to the policymakers in the United States. So if there's specific questions for you, would it be, be appropriate? Dever, why don't you come up here then? Um, care for a chair? We don't have to spend a lot of time on that decision. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to make a comment about that study based on just what Dr. Taylor said. When a cell phone is on and when you're talking into it and someone is receiving information, that's when you're going to have the highest level. So if there's silence, the radiation level is lower. S sim similarly, uh, when someone is talking to you and you're listening, the levels are going to go up. So if you've got a cell phone that's on mute, it's not transmitting any information. Um, so the level of exposure will, will vary from airplane mode, which is the lowest, to having it off airplane mode with perhaps your cell phones have multiple. I don't know how old the cell phone was that he used, but they have four different antennas. And depending on which antennas are on, you're going to have that kind of radiation. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that if you have a metal cage, it will actually shield some of the microwave radiation, so it depends on the size of the um, wires in the cage. And one of the things I would strongly encourage him to do, perhaps through DEVRA, is they can still measure, they can't measure SAR, specific absorption rate, but they can measure the power density. And that's the amount of radiation coming through. They can still do that. Um, all they have to do is use the same cage, the same cell phone, uh, under the same conditions, and put a meter inside the cage, and they can, they can measure it very close to the phone versus right down on the bottom where mice are going around. And this information, just as Rena suggested, is incredibly important. Even though we can't make the uh, uh, strict um, connection from a, you know, a, a lab rat to a, a human being, just knowing what the exposure was that had the effect on the animals is really important. And my guess is that um, the way that I understand it was set up, it's going to be fairly low exposure compared to what we're exposed to in our regular lives using a cell phone. Right. Yeah, he did. I think he did say it was engaged in a call. So somehow they had another phone that they would call and then keep the thing engaged in a call during that period. Yeah. Is that you right? Have to have sound coming through at yes. Time. Is that right? Yeah. So you yeah. Have to do Boy, what well, you, you know about on, cell phones? You have to turn on a tape recorder and have yeah. just play music. Is that right? Eh? Yeah, I think, th I, you know, I will check on, on that, but you're absolutely right. The exposures were relatively low just because of the distance. It was at the water bottle, as I'm sure he told you, and so it was at the water bottle of the cage, and I, the paper says it was of 7 to, I think, 15 centimeters, which, as you know, is several inches away. And again, you know, these animals don't use the phone, so you were getting the whole body, but they do drink a lot. You know, they, they, uh, rodents need a lot of water. So, and they both, and both cages had the, had a phone at the water bottle. In one cage, the phone was on, and one cage they were not. Right. Um, according to the CDC data, um, one in 10 children now have ADD or ADHD, and the rates of autism are rising very rapidly. 
right. at a significant cost to both the education system, to the health system, and to family life and welfare. It is interesting to me that given these costs, that Health Canada, when we raised this study with them, um, actually wrote back to us saying that they could not consider the study uh, on the basis of two things. One was we couldn't get the exact measurement of the radiation in the cage. And the second, which was very frustrating, was on the basis that um, there were confounding factors. So almost every research study has a paragraph, and especially epidemiological studies, saying there could be other confounding factors. So that would give me an indication that Health Canada is choosing to ignore the majority of the science that shows harm on the basis of confounding factors. Well, this, this raises yet another reason why I think that a white paper should be prepared with people like Professor Taylor, the, the fellows that I presented today, Suleiman Kaplan, the guys from Turkey, Nezrin Sahan, a whole bunch of people who've actually done this research. And there's a lot of research, it's not one study. You know, That's the thing I want to stress to you. Hugh Taylor's study is part of a substantial literature. And you know you can pick thing, pick it apart, but really you can't make it go away. Another thing, and I'm, I know many of you are aware of, is that South Korea was one of the most wired countries of the world. And South Korea has two things that has developed there recently. They have a phenomenon that the neuropsychiatrists characterize as digital dementia. This is a classification of a disease in children, digital dementia characterized by MRI showing lack of development of the right hemisphere, the hemisphere of the brain thought to be more responsible for empathy, eye contact, the ability to anticipate the consequences of your action. Autism. Okay, and South Korea has the world's highest recorded rate of autism. Highest, by I'm, I'm almost twice as high as, as almost any other country. So the neuropsychiatrists of South Korea, I was just on an email just this morning with some of them, are really concerned about this, and the government of South Korea is as well. And if any of you have contacts in South Korea or married to Koreans, we really need to reach, we need to have uh, more contact with people in that community. Because of course, think about the consequences for us of an entire generation lacking empathy, and the ability to anticipate the consequences of actions. It's hard enough for teenagers nowadays. Yeah. I'm just going to apologize. Uh, Dorothy reminded me, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Deborah McCutcheon, and I'm with C4ST. Okay. And a phenomenon for whom, to, for whom we're all grateful. Thank you, Deborah. So um, just before I ask my question um, and make my comments, I wanted to inform people of the fact that Deborah Davis was interviewed by Wendy Mesley when we launched her book here, was it three years ago, Disconnect? Was it three or two? Four. Four years. And um, is, is that interview with Wendy Mesley on your website? No. It'll be on the CBC website, like everything else. Is it else still on? No, that not sure. everything yeah. is on. CBC I mean, is the, you know, is the, it's one of the best websites in the world for that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, maybe we should highlight it, and maybe you could put it on your website. Thank you, it's a Dorothy. Really valuable. I'm looking for volunteers who can always help us. <clears throat> Our website is woefully uh, understaffed and inadequate. But I, what the point I would make is that Wendy Mesley is one of the world's best reporters on this issue. She interviewed uh, George Carlo in the 1990s when the Clinton administration, of which I was an official, invested uh, with the industry $27 million of industry money in a joint government industry program to study cell phone radiation that produced no real results. Right. Right. So um, also, I wanted to mention that I've produced two films that Deborah Davis is in. One is called Exposure, Environmental Links to Breast Cancer, and that's online. And another one is called Toxic Trespass, which is on children's health and the environment. That's a National Film Board co-production. Um, so we have a lot of useful educational tools around to help people to learn about a lot of issues. Um, with regard to the presentation of the previous speaker, um, I was a little bit concerned, and, and it relates to Rena's question about numbers and you know facts, and, and some of you are very good at that. 
What we need to really focus on for people who aren't going to learn all those numbers, and most people are not going to learn all those numbers, nor are they really interested in knowing exactly what it is, I think it's really important to stress that there is no safe dose when it comes to the developing fetus. Rapidly multiplying cells, we talk about windows of vulnerability, that's Sandra Steingraber's work, and it's really important to note that, and when he showed that whole list, he had that picture of all the chemicals in, a, in, in bottles at the top. There's no safe dose when it comes to those very vulnerable stages of development. So that we, we, we need to say that there's no safe dose when it comes to those periods of vulnerability that are so important. And as we've said, there will always be pregnant women, there will always be growing children, and there will always be little girls with developing breasts and little boys developing their sperm. I mean, there, if there's no safe dose, and we really need to say that you've got to take it away, don't keep it near them, and let them understand that this is a precautionary principle, because we, we're, we're fooling around now with numbers which are important to some people, but really it, the explanation has to be that we have to stop it. Well, as Dr. Miller said earlier today, <clears throat> the concept of ALARA, as low as reasonably achievable, has been accepted in pediatric radiology for years. You have to do radiologic imaging if you have a child with an injury or a concussion, but you want to have the dose as low as reasonably achievable. And I think that that standard ought to be applied to these devices as well. I mean, what other known or possible carcinogen do you want your children to play with? The idea that this government is going to be giving children a known or possible carcinogen to use in school it makes very little sense to me when there's no evidence that the wireless radiation has any role to play in improving their learning. If you had wired computers, we're not opposed to technology in education. I'm working with a group in South Africa now that has succeeded in a private school to have only wired computers, only wired. And it wouldn't be that hard. However, Apple, which has had this competitive edge, has succeeded in convincing educators, without any data to support it, that they need wireless. They do not. There are no data to show that the wireless devices actually improve learning. Right. And just before we get to the last two questions, thank you, Dorothy. And Dorothy spoke to, yes, you will, the, the, this whole idea that we don't have to fully understand it in order to prevent it. And I think that's one of the critical messages here. We have two more people, and then we're going to have our panel discussion. So please. I just had a quick comment. Yeah. Um, in terms of reaching family doctors, I know the mother risk uh, column that's published regularly. Does anyone know? No, so but we mother, know it now. <laughs> mother risk is a service through Hospital for Sick Children where uh, doctors and, and pregnant patients can call in and ask about exposure. So when my patient asks me about nail polish or Tylenol in pregnancy and breastfeeding, they can call into that line. And they, every month, I think, publish a document reviewing um, a fetal exposure paper for family doctors. And it's quite popular. I'm just, I don't know how to this connect This is excellent. That, and if but, maybe uh, if this great. is one of the most important things that will come out If you want to reach family today, doctors. You. Would you yes. like to volunteer to help us? Um, because we need more people involved with technical expertise. I can tell you that Dr. Taylor and I will help you, but and I will give you, there's a literature here that needs to be looked at uh, and, and in, in terms of that resource. It's an excellent opportunity, but we need more people who can, who can do this, and I think that would, it would be a good, great idea. Let me just idea. give you a quick anecdote about how maybe people here can help beyond their medical practices if they want to get involved. Very recently, Deborah and Frank and I were involved in a conference call where there was, and it was around Hugh Taylor's research coming out, and we were trying to get some press coming out of that. And what happened was we had this idea that we would have this card that, that Deborah talked about that is in birthing hospitals that says, oh, by the way, you're in here, you're pregnant, and you know we want to know about your birth plan. We want to know all the stuff that women go through. And by the way, here's a card that you, with, you know, don't put your cell phone near your body. Wouldn't it be great if we simply had enough of them to hand out to the hospitals and they went into the birthing rooms? Because we know where children are born, right? They're not born all over the place. They're born in hospitals, almost all of them, except for the midwifery centers, and, and those are also registered. We could get to them, and we need 
we need bench strength on organizing that because it was decided that it was a great idea. We had the literature, we had some of the stuff printed out, but we didn't have the infrastructure right. to send that stuff out. But if we could then announce that we have given this information to a certain percentage of birthing centers and hospitals across the province of Ontario, then we can just simply ignore what the government says in terms of safety and give them the truth of the science. We actually have some cards that Professor Taylor and I have developed. I have, a, I have some of them here today. Any of you who have pregnant patients, I'll give them to you. I don't have enough for everybody. And we hope that one of the projects that CPRST will develop in the future will be to expand what we call Baby Safe Project. That's one word, babysafeproject.org. That exists right now. We have more than 100 pediatricians and OBGYNs who have signed on to a declaration about exactly this, that we want to inform every pregnant woman during pregnancy, not, not at birth, by the way, Rodney. We want them to get informed as early as possible. And we want them to be aware that throughout pregnancy, uh, and ironically at the very end especially, you want to protect the pregnant abdomen. And there have been these insane commercials uh, with babies and, you know, talking like trash talking babies using these devices uh, that have been um, amazing, uh, that completely ignore what we know about the dangers of these things. So that's one of the things we're going to do in India. That's one of the things that we'd love to expand here. But again, we don't have the infrastructure and we need people from this meeting. If you know others who can volunteer and sign on to help uh, promote this, it would be great. It would be very helpful. Thank you. Yes. Sheena, did you have a comment? You don't need a microphone, That's Sheena. That's true. I was just going to say, um, on the pregnancy test, in that little package, wouldn't it be great to, you know, some of the top risks of mother risk saying, you know, not to use your cell phone. like Reach right out at, to the companies. That conception, the, sure. the pregnancy test, having You're a little insert. You're thinking all the time. That's great. 